time for This Week in Science. You ready, Blair? I'm so ready. You're ready. Are we ready out there, everyone? Welcome to our weekly live broadcast of the TWIS podcast. It's just ladies' night tonight for science. Mm -hmm. Blair and I are here with our towels. Yeah. We're, yes, ready for anything. Perfect. And this <laughs> we are prepared. That is right. And we're ready to have a great show. And we hope that you are too. Know that everything here is live as we're taping it. The podcast will be edited. Maybe. Maybe we'll do a tight 90. You never know. So let us begin our show in a, just a little moment here. Oops, as I remember... Uh, you know, sometimes you have to scooch things over and squeeze things over and you haven't done it yet. And then it's time. And oh, here we go. Time to scooch and squeech. OK, now let's start our show in. Oh, wait, Blair, mm -hmm. do you want to read the disclaimer I wrote? Sure. OK, great. Cold <laughs> read. Here we go. Cold read. <laughs> Never looked at it before. We're doing it. <laughs> awesome. Now we're going to go in three. Two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 877, recorded on Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. Don't forget your towel or science. Hey, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki. And tonight on Twist, we will fill your heads with termite trees, bird buds, and pea pals. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. If you've been hitchhiking through the galaxy, you'll know that preparation is key. Expect the unexpected and you'll never be caught off guard. Know there are unknowns and you'll always be knowledgeable, or you'll at least feel better about facing the probable crapshoot that is your future. Look back for inspira inspiration, but don't get dragged downhill. Look forward with optimism and be ready for change. Look outward, look inward, look upward, look downward, look skyward. The last one will keep things from landing on your head and just might help you catch your next ride. But only if you don't forget your towel. And the latest episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. And a good science to you too, Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again, minus a Justin, as he is soon to be in transit back to the United States. But we are moving forward with our science and our towels. So let us move into the science for the week. I have stories about AI moving science forward, termite travels, bird stuff, and um, and more. I've got a lot more, hmm. but we'll get to it. What did you bring for the Animal Corner, Blair? Oh, I uh, for the Animal Corner, I brought dolphin pee and uh, baby turtles. But I also have a fun story about uh, skydiving salamanders and also the hygiene hypothesis, return of the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, we've never talked about that before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Once or twice. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to clean up with our science. Not too much. Not too much. Just enough. We're just, just enough cleaning. That's right. As we jump in, I want to let you all know that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us. All places podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. You'll also find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, where we stream weekly on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. You can find us on Twitch, Instagram, and Twitter as Twist Science. And if all this is just so much to fill your head with, then just go to our website, which is twist.org. 
All right. You ready to jump into the science? Yes. Give me the the short stories. The short stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start with some artificial intelligence. Just really moving science forward and potentially leading us to, you know, the future of science, really. I mean, that's the bigger picture. But the the short story is that published this week in Nature Astronomy is a paper by Joshua Bloom and his colleagues showing how a machine 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 a machine learning inference algorithm, an artificial intelligence algorithm, was able to find details related to gravitational lensing that scientists over the decades since it was uh, first first shown by Albert Einstein, have not picked up on. So gravitational lensing is the way that we are able to use the magnetic, not the, the gravi not magnetic, the gravitational field around a star or an object and how it bends light into a new trajectory as light passes around that object. Light is affected by gravitational fields. Fascinating, right? So the idea with searching for exoplanets is that we can use one star in front of uh, a planet that passes in front of one star. And as that happens, we're able to see the dimming of the light. When there is a star in front of a star with a planet going around, then you have a gravitational influence that occurs because of the star and the orbital mechanics of the planet around the star that it's orbiting. Anyway. Physicists, astrophysicists for decades have basically said, okay, there's a couple of outcomes to this, and we and they split it up into a couple of different categories. The AI said, mm -mm, it's more complicated than that. Which <laughs> silly humans. <laughs> silly humans, you're missing out on all sorts of nuance. And so now, you know, it doesn't make things easier for astrophysicists who are trying to figure out the uh, the exact location and orbital mechanics of transiting planets in front of stars, transiting other stars. You know, it doesn't make it easier on them. It makes it a little, it makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's going to be more accurate over time. So uh, the, the way that normally the orbital stuff is worked out with this gravitational, in this sense, gravitational micro lensing, um, they call it degeneracy. And so instead of just two degenerates, there's just a whole posse of degenerates <laughs> <laughs> that are now leading to a whole unifying theory for this gravitational lensing instance. AI showing up the humans. Yeah. And so like, really, like as I alluded to right in the beginning of this story, is that there are many things where humans, you know, we think our pattern recognition is fantastic. But when you start looking at massive data sets, and when you start looking at, uh, at the various combinations, when there are lots of parameters involved that make it more complicated, that's when the machine learning can really start discovering things that are outside our abilities. And that's what's going to, you know, humans in conjunction with artificial intelligences are going to push science forward. Mm -hmm. Are you afraid? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fear the AI. If they figure out the, the, the physics before we do, then we're really doomed. Why? That's, you know, they'll figure the out AI. theoretical physics. Yeah. And they'll yeah. just start doing things that looks like magic to us, but they're understanding the universe in ways we never have. We won't stand right. a chance. Well, if the artificial <laughs> intelligences have already figured out time travel, wouldn't we know it? Unless the they don't want us to know it. Mm. Maybe it's and all playing off as it so, is yeah. supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right. So you yeah. don't want to live with an AI, but what? what about you live with a dog? Oh, I love it. And yeah. it turns out it's good for you because living with dogs or large families is gross. And that's a good thing. 
What? Why? Why yes. is it dogs or large families? I'm gonna tell you. Okay. So this is this is a study looking at the hygiene hypothesis, something we've talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. The idea is that lack of exposure too clean of an environment growing up, uh, lack of exposure to microbes early in life actually leads to immune issues because if you're not exposed to those things growing up, then um, then your body overreacts when they show up later on, essentially. And so um, researchers used an environmental questionnaire to collect information from nearly 4,300 relatives of people with Crohn's disease and enrolled in the Crohn's in, and Colitis Can Canada Genetic Environmental and Microbial Project, the CCC GEM project. Okay. They specifically wanted to look at Crohn's disease because it is an inflammatory disease in the gut that um, they think could have something to do with this. They analyzed okay. several environmental factors, including family size, presence of dogs, presence of cats, other household pets, numbers of bathrooms in the house, whether they lived on a farm, whether they drank unpasteurized milk, whether they drank well water. And they also looked at the age at the time of exposure for all of these things. What they found, again, this is purely a correlation from a self-reported survey. So this is a lot of asterisks. This is not direct evidence. But what they found yeah. from this survey, this questionnaire, is that exposure to dogs, particularly between age 5 and 15, was linked to healthy gut permeability and microbe balance and the body's immune response as well. All those things are protectors against Crohn's disease. They did not see that result with cats. They're not sure why. But that's they, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's the different proteins in the saliva that, that are usually become allergens. I don't know. This is interesting. So it could be that. Okay. They suggest it might have something to do with the, the activities that owners generally get up to with dogs versus cats and that dogs force owners outside. So you get more environmental Ooh. exposure. I also think it's because people roll around with dogs and dogs are, are pretty gross. <laughs> And dogs will like <laughs> lick you on the face all the time around yeah. right after they've licked their butt. Like, uh. even if you want to believe my dog doesn't do that, it's <laughs> happened. Okay. It's happened. Get over it. <laughs> but that's my theory. But it is also true with family, uh, with families of three or more members um, <laughs> in the first year of life. I would argue similar, just grossness <laughs> terms, picking your nose and then touching your sibling's face, you know, just like all of that, right? Kids not washing hands, yeah. lots yeah. of just, you know, the, the, the ri twin rivers, the 11s streaming down the nose, like all yes. things. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but so this is what they saw, dogs and larger families. They hope that these findings will help us physicians um, kind of know what questions to ask when they are determining who is at high risk for gut issues. So if you say mm. you have a dog, that actually could be relevant medical information. Okay, you have a dog. You are less likely to have Crohn's disease. This might impact how I treat your symptoms or it might impact how we look out for it as you age, right? So it's even if you can't figure out the exact... Um, kind of mechanism right away, it could still help with medical care if you know there is a correlation. You can kind of test it out, figure out if that correlation might be causative, and then you can use that information to impact your care. So it's still way, that's way down the line. This is yeah. really just, hey, when do you think you got a dog? And uh, when, how many how old is your sibling? At what age, and, yeah, at what age were you first licked on the face by an animal? And, <laughs> what and kind when, of animal? When did you drink well water? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, yes, it's definitely uh, subjective still, mm -hmm. but it's a very interesting addition to the hygiene hypothesis that where we talked about dishwashers before and all that kind of stuff just kind of feeds into the general theory that it's good to be exposed to some germs when you are growing up and I uh, like irritants. I like your interpretation that, you know, it's 
whether or not you're growing up in a gross situation. Yeah. Dogs and family. Rah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's something I've actually thought a lot about with COVID too, because if, uh, you know, kids spent over a year inside. And mm -hmm. so that was a long time that if they didn't, yeah. if they were a single child home without a dog, they were not getting exposed to very much irritants potentially, as opposed to if they had other siblings at home, they could have been exposed to more, or if they had a dog or seven, I don't know. So yeah. it's all, you know, it, it, uh, there's an impact there because they also could be getting exposure at school, of course. So when you mm -hmm. take that away, it changes things. You take it all away, mm -hmm. reduce the exposure suddenly. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see what happens with immune systems and allergies and autoimmune and gut disorders as mm -hmm. the generations kind of pass. What, what's going to happen 40, 50 years from now? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You have to get your inoculation when you're five of germs, basically. <laughs> Here's a cocktail we mixed up of all the potential allergens it's a in the cocktail region that you of gross. live. Yeah, exactly. Think about that. You could get exposed to allergens. You could get, get exposed to low levels, you know, basically just a vaccine, right? Low levels of um, potential diseases and then also any gut irritants or anything like that. Just expose it all when you're young. Yeah. Well, speaking of digesting things and how that works, let's talk about termites. Mm. Wood termites. Oh, yes. The scourge of many a homeowner. Yeah. Homeowners tend to not like them very much. No. However, some researchers at the Evolutionary Genomics Unit at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University with collaborators from around the world find wood termites very interesting. And they have published their research looking into the uh, phylogenetic tree, the evolution of wood termites in molecular biology and evolu evolution. Dry wood termites, they are the second most species termite species. And Blair, did you know that termites come from cockroaches? No, but they look similar. <laughs> <laughs> They have a similar body plan, look, right? Yeah. So you say they look similar, and that's really a lot of the information that we have about termites and their evolutionary history. It has to do with morphology and what they look like and where we found them. So we them. could be totally wrong. Right. <laughs> so anyway, termites are a type of cockroach. They split from cockroaches about 150 million years ago, which I find fascinating. Did not know that. That's new, just trivia point that uh, people out there just take that one, stick it in the brain bank there. Um, these dry wood termites uh, are known to form smaller colonies, usually less than 5,000 uh, individuals, as opposed to other termites, which live in the soil, in big tunnel colonies, and they're all in the underground. And those can be like thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals, millions of individuals. Um, so dry wood termites are, tend to be, you know, not quite as social, <laughs> I guess, but they're still pretty social. They're otherwise known as the Kalo termitidae. And the Kalo termitidae, because they split fairly early. So it was like the split from the cockroaches. And then around 100 million years ago, they split off from the other termites. And it was this very early split. And so they were thought to be really primitive without a lot of interesting behaviors or other things aside from like eating wood and digesting it and reproducing. That's about it. Anyway, the researchers were like, hey, let's check this out. And so they collected about 120 different species, multiple samples from around the world, and were able to uh, really look at the diversity of the various species and figure out what started where and when and how. And get my picture up here. And it turns out that they have been all over the world. They didn't just start in different places. They started in South America. These termites first split off, drywood termites first split off in South America and in uh, and then started moving around. And because they live in wood, wood likes to float, they have been across the oceans of the world some 40 times in the last 50 million years. So they've floated back and forth and back and forth on bits and chunks of wood. And then more recently, 
with our wood hold boats and uh, our our lumber that we take from place to place, humans have helped them spread from place to place around the world. And so they have actually they actually have a very interesting genetic history. A lot of uh, the diversity comes from these various, I guess, ocean travels, you know, go, you're starting in one place, going someplace there, then dividing out into multiple species. Oh, and then coming back and interacting maybe with an older species. And suddenly you have uh, these species that are sub lineages of each other kind of getting along and then you have cross pollination. And then so their their diversity is fascinating. And it turns out that they're not that simple. They actually have a lot of the complex um, behaviors that were not expected to be had in these multiple species. So, hey, who knew? Drywood termites, they're diverse, they're fancy, and they like to travel. It's They have a braided stream way better than ours, it turns they out. They do. <laughs> It's we yeah. get all excited. And we're like, well, it's not just out of Africa. We also bounced around in these areas and over here. It's like, ah, eh, termites have been around the world 50 times. <laughs> they have. They've been and, and they've really been all over the world. I mean, wow. for a species that started in South America, they've traveled around the globe. They are everywhere. And uh not and in Antarctica though. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Except for Antarctica. There's not much wood for them to chew no. on down in Antarctica. So that wouldn't be. There's just that one ship we people. talked about a couple weeks ago. Just yeah. that one. <laughs> they might yeah. pop up. It might. Yeah. So the, you know, interesting question now is uh, we've got a little bit more understanding of how interesting their history is. So now the textbooks that include termites need to be re rewritten because their phylogenetic history, which was based on morphology or how they look, is wrong in a lot of ways. So time to rewrite some of those termite textbooks yes. made from trees, which cool. termites like to eat. Oh, it's the circle. Yes. So yeah. you really do need the latest entomology textbooks. You do? Yeah. Yeah, it's some of those other things. You don't need the latest English lit textbook. Last year's was fine. History, maybe maybe that last chapter is important. All that new stuff. Biology, science, it can change drastically from year to year. So you got to get that new. There we go. One study. Suddenly, there is so much yeah. more understood yeah. about the termites. So mm -hmm. termites are one thing. Mm -hmm salamanders mm -hmm. they're yeah another i love salamanders tell me about them yeah uh you know what you might not have understood about salamanders before they fly now what yes so like the snakes. wandering salamander what a perfect name for it um they hang out at the top of redwood trees and a new study from the university of south florida has found that this highly arboreal Species of salamanders, specifically the wandering salamander, Anades vagrans, engages in parachuting and gliding to slow and direct their descent from the trees. So like, nah, nah, climbing down, that's for suckers. Who does I'm that? I'm a jump. <laughs> I'm just going to jump. For, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's yeah. a lot of work. Let's go. Yeah. So they rely on postures like skydiving humans to slow and control their fall. This really hasn't be, been looked at at salamanders ever for one very simple reason, their body does not look like it, is. it lends itself to parachuting or falling vertically without dying at all. They are little water monsters. That's their deal. <laughs> they are they are perfectly adapted for swimming. They have that blade-like tail that helps them to swim through the water. They can kind of scurry on land, but they have that sideways joint of their arms and legs. So they're not even, you know, that effective at that. So all of this to say... Why would you check to see if they're good at falling? <laughs> well, it was observed in the wild, and so it was time, you guessed it, to put salamanders in a wind tunnel. Yes. <laughs> of course. Of course. They parachuted consistently, slowing their vertical speed by up to 10% while they fell. They coupled parachuting with undulations of their tail and torso, which allowed them to affect their gliding 
at non-vertical angles at about half of the time. Not only could they slow themselves down, but they used fine scale control in pitch, roll, and yaw. That's basically just all the directions when you are yeah. falling to maintain <laughs> upright yeah. body postures. Yeah, exactly. It's just 3D is all that means. X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> they also executed banking turns and they were able to glide horizontally. So this is beyond just not dying. This is being very in control of their orientation and placement in the air. And again, this is the, the first time that this has been observed in salamanders. And now I would say the thing that's really cool about this is that it's time to reevaluate any animal's ability to do this because if you see this video, it does not look like an animal that is well adapted for this. You would not expect it no. by looking at a salamander that they would be good at parachuting, basically skydiving without a parachute, excuse me. And so right. um, that means almost any animal could potentially be capable of this because they don't have any fleshy wing-like or, or, or webbing-like or or fin-like appendages that should help them with this. They are really just using their movement to slow them down and to manipulate themselves in the air. So in theory, anybody could figure this out. I'm wondering though, I mean, they live in the treetops. You don't want to mm -hmm. just die if you fall. Right. So. I mean, so the ones animals? that I mean, don't die are immediately selected for birds in the fly, strongest right. way possible. Right. But if you're lightweight, so we know mm -hmm. that insects very often can survive falls from great heights because mm -hmm. of their mass to, you know, body size, the, the ratio that's there. Are the salamanders the same way? This particular salamander? Could we take salamanders, tiger salamanders mm -hmm. that normally stay on They're the ground? They're so chunky. I don't know They're, if they'd right. be able to do it. Yeah. So is this just be a body size and a, you know, they have a, a reflex where they spread out like a skydiver. Um, is that something that makes it more possible, whereas other salamander species would just plummet? <laughs> right. Well, because that's the other problem, right, is that we, we humans can't skydive without a parachute because, you know, of the whole momentum thing. So yeah. we're so heavy and dense that that as we fall there's an acceleration and that creates a larger force over time and so there's that whole issue mass times acceleration squared yes exactly there <laughs> you Actually, go. mass times gravity yes anyway yeah. yes and um but but yeah so i i have a similar theory that even if the tiger salamander spread out perfectly out of instinct it still might have a bad time because it is so much chunkier. These guys yeah. are small. They're like as big as your finger and they're very thin. So I, I do think part of it is just, you know, a, a feather does fall uh, slower than a bowling ball when you mm -hmm. are not in a vacuum. Not in a vacuum. No, yeah. but with air resistance, it yeah. that makes all the difference. And that's what we're talking about here is, yep. you know, natural atmospheric conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Parachuting. They've got little, I guess, they're little salamanders with squirrel suits. No. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> next time you go into a redwood forest, look up or don't, because there might be falling salamanders. For me. Look skyward. You'll be looking up. to me. <laughs> For others, they might not appreciate getting bonked on the head by a salamander. I would love it. It would make my day. I would love to catch one on my head. For mm -hmm. sure. For sure. All right, Blair, mm -hmm. you might not plummet to the earth like a salamander when it's your time to go, <laughs> but we all have aging ahead of us. That's just part of life, even though some people want to avoid aging, it does happen. And so researchers are trying to figure out, you know, what's going on inside the cells with respect to aging and how it happens. Well, we know that there is you know, our, our chromosomes are packed tightly into these structures called chromatin. And so the chromatin is all widely, wi widely, no, tightly wound around itself and around and about. And all of the, all of the uh, molecular interactions allow it to take this really tightly packed shape. Some of it is epigenetics that 
wrap around structures called histones. We have um, glyco glycosylated sugared areas that stick out and all of these epigenetic areas are part of kind of what makes us who we are, makes our bodies work the way that they do. And epigenetic stuff, while we can inherit some of it, a lot of it is stuff that might come about as we as we develop and as we grow. So the aging epigenome is something that's of a lot of interest. And these researchers just publishing in Developmental Cell we're looking at uh, large-scale chromatin reorganization around the aging epigenome. And they found that with aging, you have, there's hierarchies in the chromatin. So some areas are more preserved or their, their packing and their structure is preserved better and longer. But as you age more, there's more entropy and epigenetic instability as you age. So things that were wrapped around histones, maybe they're like, boop, I don't need that histone anymore. And so suddenly you have areas of your genes that are able to be turned into proteins that didn't used to be. And that can be bad or you know, it, it, it contributes to aging really. Along this, they found that as the deformation happens, there is basically a this entropy or what used to be structured areas within the chromatin. It just gets lazy. And so the structure starts to go away. And additionally, they discovered there is a placenta-specific protein type that starts to be excess, expressed in your cells. Normally, this protein is only expressed within the placenta. You know, and as you're growing in the womb, you, baby, are producing your placenta. And so when it's time for your, your placenta to stop growing, there are command signals that say, hey, placenta, stop doing the growth thing. We're good. And those are these same placenta-specific signals that start to pop up in aging cells with this old entropic chromatin. So it's like a circle of life thing that's going on. And I find it super fascinating that you're born and you have these control signals in your placenta that say, okay, no more placenta. It's time to be a baby and, and enter the world and do all this stuff. And then when it's time to start exiting the world, your cells are like, okay, let's do that placenta signal again. And it's time for us to, you know, maybe exit the world. No. <laughs> <laughs> that only works if you can hook me back up. 3D right? print me a placenta, please. Get me a placenta. So put it yeah, in a fanny pack carried around with me. <laughs> yeah, we, I don't know. Yeah, that'll be your your fanny pack full of like, yeah. Never, never. Anyway, yeah, yeah. No, you got it. <laughs> I, I'm all about it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, but it's interesting that the the epigenetic degradation. This like as the uh, epigenome starts to unloosen and unwind. Things that maybe were packed away related to the placenta by epigenetic uh, markers over your lifetime suddenly are opened back up again. And that they're thinking as a result, result of this study that they can start looking for this, what they call pregnancy specific beta 1 glycoprotein, PSG genes, um, as a biomarker for aging. Hmm. So that if we're able to see how much of this pregnancy specific bio uh, glycoprotein you have it could really let people know um, how they are aging you know at what point in their life and so uh, we might be able to identify aging drivers and intervention targets as well uh, so it's not all over it's you know targets are good right we like yeah. the targets for the promises of Blair's forever youth so let me let me ask one clarifying question. So if you were able to reverse this signal, that wouldn't actually do anything to your aging. This is just a, a byproduct of your aging, right? This is a signal of it, right. not a cause. Well, it's also a cause because the action of this uh, particular protein that is to stop 
the uh, the growth and the development of the placenta. And so it starts to turn off things that maintain your cells and keep mm-hmm. the cells active and healthy and instead allows uh, allows things that degrade cells and degrade metabolism to start coming into play. So this could lead, lead to treatment. It could. Information. That's very yeah. cool. I yeah. like it. Yeah. So it's one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. It's not stopping this chromatin degradation from happening in the first place, but it is a downstream thing. So yeah, mm-hmm. part of the puzzle. Neat. Yeah. Oh, Dan Christensen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> We're, I'm going to buy so many towels. <laughs> we can get all the towels now. Thank you so much for that donation. All right, Blair, do you have another story here? Or did no, I have no, it? I think it's up to you now. One more. Well, I think it's, you know, as we're talking about this, you know, if you and I start talking more and more about what the next thing we're going to do is, like eventually we'll come to a decision, right? Like a de- democratic decision, really, right? The, well... And if we had... If we had a larger group of people, we could all put our voices in. Everybody could start talking about what we wanted to do and maybe come to some kind of consensus and then do it and and coordinate Mm -hmm. our actions. Yeah. Yeah. There's usually a ringleader, but yeah, you can get a consensus out of people. You can get you can get a consensus out of people. Well, you can also get a consensus out of jackdaws. Jackdaws are a kind of corvid related to crows and ravens. And they are also as a lot of cities may have crow springs and crow falls where the crows come through and at in, in the morning or in the evening, you hear the calls of the crows as they all come to roost in the trees or they all get up and they leave and they go to wherever it is that they're going. Jackdaws have this behavior as well. And so some researchers decided that they needed to look at um, what happens with what with the sounds that the the communicative sounds that the jackdaws are making and the behaviors that they're showing. Does the amount that they caw, caw, caw talk to their jackdaw neighbors, does that make a difference in, uh, in, in what they actually do? And it turns out, what do you think, Blair? Yeah. They're yes, social animals. <laughs> they are very social animals. And so in the mornings, uh, when they are going to, uh, they roost in the trees in the winter and before they depart, there will be one or two birds that start the calling and they call more and more and more and as a larger and larger number of birds enter into the cacophony of jackdaw morning music uh it does correlate to the probability that they're all going to get up and fly away and go away so jackdaws Mm -hmm. they they yell at each other hey joe Time you ready to, to go? go? Are you, Blair? You ready? Are we ready to go now? No, not yet. Yeah, come, come on, Blair. Let's. We gotta go. Come on. <laughs> All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. Exactly. You imagine a whole neighborhood. Got to get on the bus. How do you get everybody on the bus? Everybody yells at each other. Get on the bus. And then they get on the bus. Jack Dawes. Yeah. It's one of the few examples that we have scientifically examined of this kind of coordinated communication for mass behavioral activity, which I think it's fascinating and that it seems as though we should be looking into this more and more since there are so many species that do have, birds especially in their migrations, these mass movements on a seasonal basis. Yeah, I mean... Point a finger at any Corvid, something special is going on, especially socially, right? So just just pour all the research into all the Corvids. I want to know. I want to know what they're doing. I want to know why they're doing it. I want to know how they're doing it. Yeah. Thank you, Corvids. Thank you, Corvids, for telling us. And I do have another Corvid story about Mm. their tiny, clever brains for later in the show. Yeah. More bird stuff. 
brain, bird brain stuff later in the show. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We hope you are enjoying the show. If you are enjoying the show, please tell a friend. Bring a friend to listen with you this next week. We'd love to hear from them. Hey, Blair, you want some COVID news? You got your towel? Are you prepared for COVID no stuff? No COVID news. No. <laughs> why? I guess at least it's not monkeypox news. Stick with the COVID. Well, we yeah, we're going to stick to COVID. I don't have a monkeypox section Good. for the, the rundown yet. Thank I you, mean, no. I... <laughs> this right towel's going to turn into a security blanket. Really that's cool. what I, I'm watching you. You're taking it as a security towel. COVID, go <laughs> away. <laughs> we would like it all to go away. Yes. Oh, wouldn't that be so nice? Well, few studies this week to talk about. Uh, first one on the docket is uh, published this week in Cell Metabolism. Researchers were looking at what exactly is going on in diabetic individuals to lead to them developing more severe COVID-19 symptoms um, when they do get infected. And apparently what's happening is that ACE2 is upregulated in hyperglycemia in kidney organoids and patient renal cells. And so they assume, based on this study, that this is likely what's going, hap going on in vivo as well. So in people where you have hyperglycemia, uh, you've got this the ACE2 receptor, which is important to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Actually, they're getting more of them in the kidneys, more ACE2 in the kidneys. Uh, ACE2 is also related to water movement and metabolism uh, within the kidneys. So this it, it has these dual purposes that are very important metabolically, but also can be a problem in this particular case. Um, and so with this particular study, they saw that there were increased changes to the metabolism as well within these kidney cells and in the kidney organoids that they created. And the ACE2 receptors that were upregulated in their lab experiments boosted cellular infection of SARS-CoV-2. And so it's very likely that this increased amount of ACE2 is leading to increased infection with SARS-CoV-2, specifically getting in through the bloodstream, through the kidneys, um, and in through those cells. And that the possibility, however, and here's the upside, is that now that they're seeing that there are these metabolism-related uh, effects that increase the ACE2 receptors, potentially there's a, a way that we can target energy metabolism within renal cells in patients to be able to decrease the likelihood of infection. So, or at least decrease or at least help treatment once if somebody does get infected. So understanding more about why uh, diabetes is a, a, in particular a, a, an, a, a problem uh, with this virus uh, is really important for being able to treat it more later. Right. Because as much as we would like it to just go away, it's likely going to be around forever now. So we have to find a way to protect susceptible communities moving forward. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Forever, ever, forever, ever. Well, even though it's going to be around for a lot longer and we don't really know what's going on with the BA4, BA5, all these <laughs> other <laughs> variants. Yeah. BA17. Uh, no, big deal. You know, <laughs> there is research out currently just came out this last week that uh, out of University of Wisconsin-Madison published in Nature, that the BA2 subvariant is similar to BA1 in, in the severity and in its ability to cause infection. So we weren't really sure whether BA2 was the same as the original Omicron strain, mm -hmm. and it pretty much is. So Omicron, less severe than Delta, mm -hmm. more infectious. Mm -hmm. BA2 is the same way. So the, it's, and if you, and if, I mean, for most people who are probably seeing their neighborhoods, their communities uh, with BA2, which is the dominant subvariant uh, around the world almost. I mean, seven, seven dozen countries, it's the dominant variant um, that, you know, as you're watching it go through, you might also, people are getting it more often, and mm -hmm. but not as many people are 
you, that you know potentially are ending up in the hospital. But hospitals are starting to fill up again, folks. So, you know, maybe those masks can help because we know that vaccines should not be the only protection that we have. So ventilation, masks, vaccine is great. Um, and finally, we've talked about long COVID and risk for long COVID before. And there are various studies as to the percent of individuals who end up with long COVID. Some studies have set up to 30% of people who are infected with any type of COVID end up with long COVID. Other studies say as little as 7% of individuals who are infected end up with long COVID. Well, the question has also been raised as to how does vaccination impact these probabilities? And <sighs> It's not as good as we hoped. So vaccination, according to a study out this last week, only reduces the probability of long COVID by about 15%. So it's a little, but it's not as much as we were hoping it would be. So uh, vaccination, as I said, should not be our only line of defense. It helps. It's part of the whole system. But as cases are rising, masking, social distancing, ventilation... Do what we can, everyone. This so also the math here is important to pay attention to. If it's only seven percent of people who get COVID have long COVID, and yeah, and it's more likely to be the people who are in the hospitals more often who have the long COVID. Yeah, right. And then it's it's fifteen percent of seven percent. That's that's still you know it's a very long it's a very small number still. So that yes. that is it's relatively yeah. it's a small number but the other thing i was thinking about is if the vaccine is less likely to get you if taking the vaccine prevents you from dying it could actually yes. push those numbers higher than it would be otherwise because you're you have kind of this confounding variable now of you didn't die so if you could magically figure out if people who died from covid were going to get long covid you might find out that the difference is actually much bigger. Yeah. But because all those people die who didn't get vaccinated, they're not part of the factoring in of who gets long COVID and who doesn't, right? So it, it kind of, it messes with the numbers a little bit so that you have this bigger physical number. You have this larger N as opposed to a percentage, right? Of yeah. people with long COVID who are vaccinated because there's this whole group, this whole number of people who, who are dead. It's, it, it, yeah. it hurts yeah. your brain to think about, but it totally influences the numbers. Yeah. And yeah, these are the kinds of things that the uh, epidemiologists, the public health statisticians, you know, these are the kinds of things that they're having to take into account to try and figure all this out. Yeah. I will let their brain hurts. Their, their brain hurts. Their brains hurt for me. Yes. And I will also say, you know, Long COVID still sucks. And I'm not trying to say yeah. that it doesn't. But if I was picking, I'd rather have long COVID than die. So it's, that's yeah, kind it's, of it's like, one over the, it's which, you know. And it's <laughs> the, the, tough the, 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 because the, the, there, there's some long COVID. varying levels. truly horrendous. <laughs> but it's still, yeah, it still is a question of like, the, I think overall, it seems like the vaccine did an excellent job at preventing death, which was its main job. Yep. Yep. And prevent, yeah, preventing death and reducing severe disease as well. So fewer people end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is true. Oh, and monkeypox, by the way, it's, mm -hmm. it, it, yes, it's spreading, but it doesn't spread at all the same way no. that uh, SARS-CoV-2 yeah. does. Uh, it don't touch by... any strangers with rashes or yes. anyone with a rash who's been out of the country recently. Just don't touch yes. them. Fun. And people who have been uh, who have been inoculated for smallpox are probably less likely to be infected with monkeypox. And the monkeypox is likely spreading more easily because we have a whole lot of generations, few generations now that have never experienced smallpox because we eradicated it. We got rid of it. Right. And we you know, so now st stores of smallpox and monkeypox vaccine are being brought out of our uh, storehouses to enable vaccination inoculation for various uh, populations that are highly at risk. But yeah, 
if it's an obvious rash, pustules, those kinds of things, just stay home and call your doctor. Stay away from other people. People don't go rubbing up on each other at a rave. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. how it mm -hmm. is. That, this could be a myth. And I, sound I don't sound advice myths. regardless. Regardless. <laughs> Ew, it's sweaty. Okay. <laughs> Enough about that. Ah. Uh, this is This Week in Science. It's uh, me and Blair tonight talking about all the science that we wanted to bring for Ladies Night with our Ladies towels Ladies. and science. Woo! If you're enjoying the show, please head over to our website, twist.org, and click on the Patreon link. Patreon is how listeners of the show, people who enjoy the show like you, help support what we're doing here. Patreon allows us to be able to keep track of you and to send you rewards, small ones, $10 and more a month, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show, there are other things that come in the mail, little fun gifties for various levels. You can check out how the levels of support work with you and your budget. But any amount really helps us to do this show every single week and keep it going. We really appreciate your support and can't do this without you. Thank you. All right, let's come back now. There's what is it? This time in the show where we don't want to talk about COVID. We don't want to talk about the monkeypox. We only want to talk about the animals. Yes. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, mill, pet, no pet at all. What you got, Blair? <gasps> oh my goodness. Would you like to hear about dolphins as pee pals? <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> this is all about bottlenose dolphins. Always <laughs> fun stories from our buddies, the bottlenose dolphins. And a recent study finds out, this is from the University of St. Andrews, that they taste the urine of their friends in the water to figure out who's around. They keep their mouths open and sample urine for longer from familiar individuals than unfamiliar ones. And so this is uh, the first case, as far as these researchers know, of a vertebrate shown to have social recognition through taste alone. Now this is where, Kiki, it's time to put on your skeptic hat because here is their reasoning. <laughs> Dolphins do not have olfactory bulbs. Wait, what? <laughs> Leaving the team certain it was taste and not smell at play. Now, okay. <sighs> Let's They're under the water, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But they don't have olfactory bulbs. First of all, we've played that game before. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh -huh. <laughs> With birds. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see okay. if we, if, if truly they do not have olfactory bulbs. But even that, yeah. the thing is, this sounded very similar to me to things that other mammals do. And I'll get to that in a second. But just to kind of explain what these dolphins are doing. They, um, the bottles nose dolphins, they are, so first of all, this was a good individual species to look at this in because they already know that they have signature whistles for specific individuals. So they, they remember individuals, which is hard to test in other species in general. How do you know this dog from that dog or this cow from that cow? And so because dolphins have been proven to have these whistles that are almost like names for individuals, right? And that they can remember them for over 20 years. This means they have this baseline understanding of individuals and can tell individuals apart. So then they wanted to see if they could tell them apart by their urine. So they presented eight dolphins with different urine samples from familiar and unfamiliar individuals. They found that they spent about three times as long sampling the urine from those that they knew. They're really swishing it around to try to figure out what's going on. Oh my goodness. 
Um, so the the basis for this that they might care about the urine also comes from something that's been observed that's called genital inspection. So this is when dolphins use their jaw to touch the genitals of another individual. And in many uh, um, situations, there is some urine expressed. And so that's a good opportunity for them to taste it and make an association of this urine. Steve's urine tastes like this, basically. <laughs> And so then when you go, when they go into the water and they smell, they taste a specific urine, they're like, oh, that's Steve. Steve was here a little bit ago. So this is their theory. What this sounds like to me is something that a lot of mammals do that involves the tasting or smelling of urine. For example, giraffes they will actually taste the urine, the males will taste the urine of the female to see if she's an estrus before they attempt to mate. So they, okay. they, they fully, you know, they, they kind of do their, their special dance where the female goes, okay, yeah, yeah. Basically, you want me to pee for you, I'll pee for you. <laughs> so she pees and then the male tastes it and goes, yes, now is the time. She's an estrus. There's also this whole thing called phlegmin response which is where um, mostly hoofstock, but also cats, there's a lot of different mammals will smell the urine of a female. And if she, and they'll do this crazy face, which is the Fleming response, where they, they curl up their front lip like completely. And it's actually to expose the specific skin above their teeth so that the, the hormone, the pheromones can interact with um the, the vomeronasal organ yes also called the jacobson's organ which is the thing that snakes have to be able to quote unquote taste the air right it's the same supposedly organ, we don't whole. have because we haven't found it yet right and so this is an olfactory sense organ so they consider this a smell-based organ this seems too similar yeah for so similar. that to not be part of this and I was not part of this research team, and I don't know if they tested, you know, if if estrus timing had anything to do with any of this, or if it was related with any mating opportunities or anything like that. But this is where I would research next if I was in charge of these dolphins, <laughs> is because it really feels like it is somehow related to this opportunity. Dolphins came from land mammals. So they they have actually a lot more in common with these animals that have phlegm and responses on land than than we like to think because they feel right. so different. But um, yeah. so that's what's really ringing true to me about this study. The other crazy thing about this is that the researchers actually think that they're they might be able to use this information to have impacts on human obesity. So stick with me. <laughs> they believe that the same gene that allows dolphins to identify the lipids in urine that they use to identify individuals, also identify um, other information from them, that these are the same that are present in humans where it helps them to know if they've had enough to eat. It's the same lipids really? so that yeah huh. so they think that studying the gene in dolphins could sorry it's the same gene not the same lipids it's the same gene so they think that studying the gene in dolphins could improve understanding of how we regulate our own intake <laughs> seems like a bit of a jump to me um but they think that it's related so they they think there's something to that but also knowing that there's human caused pollution like oil spills and other chemical runoff that also are going into the water mean that there could be an impact to dolphins ability to single one, signal one another. So there's these two other crazy ideas. So one is that somehow you could use this knowledge of this gene to help with human obesity, but the other crazy idea, less crazy, but still kind of very interesting is that you have to keep in mind when you are, spewing pollution into waterways that you could be impacting dolphins ability to taste each other's pee. So consider that. 
<laughs> I will definitely be considering the considering it the next time I try to pollute a waterway. But think about the dolphins <laughs> trying to taste each other's pee. Uh, Don't pollute. Uh, I'm I'm going to say I think that the uh the the link to human obesity is kind of a stretch, but I do appreciate the you know the the implications for here we have an animal who exists in its, you know, we go through air. And if you walk through a plume of smoke, you walk through pollution that you can smell or, you know, something that is noxious, that affects the way you breathe or the way you feel, you're going it, to, it's really going to affect you. Um, and if you're an animal, like humans, we apparently, you know, we've got pheromones, pheromones, hormones, body odor, that kind of stuff. But we don't use it the same way these other animals do, obviously. But if you're an animal like a dolphin who uses the scents in the water, the scent tastes yeah. in the water. Yeah. We're impacting all sorts of life in the mm -hmm. water where they, you know, use yeah. these chemicals to survive. <sighs> yeah. Meanwhile, survival. Mm -hmm. If you're a baby leatherback turtle, oh, it's all turtle. about the moon. Yes, it is. And not how you would think, actually. So... Uh, when you're a sea turtle hatchling and you emerge from your nest, it's usually at night, and you have to crawl towards the ocean, this is called sea finding, you have to do it quickly and efficiently because otherwise you will get it by birds, crabs, raccoons. It's a, it's a harrowing journey. And the way that you would do this as a baby turtle, I'm just going to keep talking to you, the audience, as you are all baby turtles, you would figure this out because the sea... Uh, the sea would actually be dimmer than the land um, or brighter than the dimmer landward horizon. So the idea is the, um, the moon is out. The moon is reflecting on the ocean. It does not reflect off the beach entries behind you. So it's brighter towards the ocean. So you got to walk towards the brightness. You got to shuffle towards the brightness. Sorry, I forgot. Huh. About turtles. <laughs> A little baby turtle shuffle. Yes. So this helps them to find the ocean even when it's uneven and maybe they have to go up a bank to go back down. They're following the brightness. This study looks at, uh, this is from Florida Atlantic University, and it's looking at the difference between leatherback sea turtles and um, loggerhead sea turtles. And leatherbacks, Dermochelis coriacea, they often will crawl around in circles trying to find the ocean. They have trouble. It delays their entry, and of course, that changes their survival. The hard-shelled turtles, the loggerheads, they uh, are more sensitive to light. They have an easier time finding their way to water. Those other backs, less sensitive, harder to figure it out, spend more time going around in circles. Leatherback this means, eyes. This means backwards. Yeah. The ones yeah. with the hard shells who have a little bit more protection right. are like, oh, it's so easy. And the ones that are more set and sensitive yeah. are like, where? I mean, yeah, absolutely. It, does, me. it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> um, so the, the other strange thing is then when these researchers looked closer, when they first just noticed that the leatherbacks were going around in circles over and over and over, they looked at leatherback eyes and there was not any obvious structural adaptation that might promote improved visual function under dim lights. They didn't have a larger cornea. They didn't have a larger lens. They weren't able to gather light more efficiently. And so the, the their eyes are inferior for this task is ultimately what it comes down to. And so the only time that they were really good at getting straight to the ocean is during is closer to the full moon. When it was during a new moon, when it was very dark, they had a really, really hard time. They were going all over the place. And so the, so this is, first of all, just helpful to know with turtles because they're endangered, obviously. And light pollution can be a problem because if they're trained to go towards brightness and there is artificial light somewhere, that can mess them up. This is part of the reason that sea turtle nesting beaches are so well protected and monitored because stuff like that can really mess them up. But the, the reason researchers think that these leatherbacks are so poorly equipped for their journey so early in life is that they actually um, are better at seeing in the ocean once they get there. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
So the the costs persist. Basically, the, the reason it's it's beneficial to have trouble finding the ocean originally is that they are better once they get in the ocean at detecting prey, mates, and favorable habitats. Loggerheads, alternatively, are mostly in shallow coastal waters. Very clear waters, easy to navigate, all that good stuff. The leatherbacks go way deep. And so they have to deal with a lot more murky waters, darker waters, that kind of stuff. But just the, the way their eye is structured, researchers think it's beneficial in the long run. But that does mean that their survivorship is is not great. It's um, very low yeah. <laughs> when yes. they're young. It is about one in 1,000 to one in 10,000 leatherbacks <sighs> will see adulthood. So wow. it's, it's, not, it's not great. That's awful. Yeah. Wow. I had no, I had no idea that was the, the ratio. That's, mm -hmm. that's why <laughs> sea turtles lay hundreds to thousands hundreds. of eggs, yeah. depending yeah. on the species. And yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. <laughs> There's a question. Uh, couldn't they assist turtles with bright lights that are well-placed? So on moonless nights, yes. wouldn't it be a great idea to take big stadium lights and shine them at the ocean? Yes. And I would not be surprised if turtle uh, conservationists currently do that. That sounds like something they might do. Yeah. I mean, what can we do currently? What are the things that we can do to help these poor little turtles who die at such... <laughs> such high rates well here's the thing yeah. before humans stomped on the scene stomp 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 probably driving some animals to extinction as they stepped um they they did fine because once they got to the ocean they thrived and their numbers were good climate change wasn't happening so they had these big clutches of eggs and it was okay that one in 1000 survived but now that sea turtles have all these other problems climate change they have pollution they have um, poaching. They have all these other things that are happening to them. Now it's too many things. Their populations can't handle it. Yeah. And that's why we're seeing this problem. It's not It's not that this survivorship, and I, it sounds really mean, but really it was, it was part of how it was working before. You laid a giant clutch and some of them made it. But because right. we're now having this kind of back-end pressure on adults that didn't really exist before. They were nigh indestructible, except for maybe, maybe by bull sharks or tiger sharks. Um, th that Now there's this extra pressure that is all of yeah. the human impact. And so it's now it's a problem. <laughs> now we'd like more of them to make it to the ocean. Yeah, we would. We would like many, many more of them to make it to the ocean and mm -hmm. not eat plastic bags that they think are jellyfish. Mm-hmm. Or get straws stuck up their nose. Get straws up their noses? No. I thought that was only a problem for elementary school kids. Oh, no. No. Okay. Unfortunate. Ha <laughs> ha. Unforch. That is that is that all you have for the oh animal, animal corner? corner? Just dolphins and turtles today. Very aquatic episode. This is a very aquatic episode. And, you know, earlier plummeting. Oh, yes, Salamanders. Salamandre. <laughs> From the trees to the seas and beyond. Well, I want to talk to you about corvids. Can we talk about birds? I'm going to take it a little Always. bit. Always. Yes, I'm going to take it a little bit further for a bit of bird brain conversation. So uh, there's been a question for a very long time. Birds have very small brains. How is it possible that some of them have incredible cognitive abilities? Corvids are a family of birds, crows, ravens, jackdaws, scrub jays, magpies. They're all in this family of corvids that are capable of such amazing feats of memory and cognitive ability. Um, one of the things that's very uh, interesting about their abilities is that they are very I guess, uh, plastic or they, they can switch strategies if they need to. They are, uh, they can adjust what they're working on. So they're not just focused on only doing things a particular way. They can learn fairly quickly 
-hmm. more quickly than other species uh, when it comes to various tests that we've given them. Um, so there's this question of how to, how they do it. Well, a bunch of researchers said, well, let's just get down to it and look at their brains. So, <laughs> so they get compared a whole bunch of brains between chickens, pigeons, ostriches, and some some crows, carrion crows and others. So they took a whole bunch of corvids and non-corvids and looked to see what was going on because they're like, okay, one of the hypotheses is number of neurons. It, and so number of neurons in different areas of the brain. The telencephalon is kind of like the, the big processing area of the brain in the bird brain. And so they said, okay, maybe number of neurons there compared to cross and they said nope it's all pretty much the same oh interesting crows and ostriches have very similar number of neurons in their telencephalons which i find very interesting because ostriches are such big birds <laughs> they're not very okay. smart <laughs> and yeah comparatively very very fascinating here yeah um and so then they extended their hypothesis hypothesis a bit to 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 suggest that Maybe it's not just the overall telencephalon that's important, but parts of the telencephalon in specific. So uh, high neuron counts in what are called associative pallial areas. And these are areas that are thought to drive flexible complex cognition. And so they uh, comparatively, these are the, the associative pallial areas would be Comparable, comparable to some of the higher processing cortical regions in the primate brain that allow primates to do a lot of the amazing feats of cognition that we're able to do. So they looked in these pallial areas and they're like, oh, corvids have more neurons than chickens and, and pigeons, which is not really a big deal, but really they're very specific areas were twice as high in corvids than in all the other birds. So the corvids had these very specific, these associative palli pallial areas, the mesopallium, the nidopallium, the subpallium. There's all these areas in the brain that the corvids had more. They had it better. Uh, so it really does kind of add to this, this story that researchers are trying to figure out is what makes the corvid brain so special. And it is apparently the allotment of neurons. So where are the neurons more densely packed? Where are they, where, where are the resources in the brain and, and where are the connections happening? And so these associative areas, it's kind of, it's not just the areas, it's the fact that they're associated with each other and so they have connections kind of between them and that's another aspect of the primate brain which is that there are these connections and networks that allow um, very complex thought to occur i'm glad we're figuring this out because otherwise i'd just be convinced that crows are cryptids um <laughs> they're not cryptids nope for the first half of this story i was like so what is it then I can't, there has to be an explanation. If not, it's magic. Right. And because they're just I'm so actually... far and away smarter than other birds. Right. I mean, except for maybe uh, the parrots, the Ossines, or, you know, there are yeah. definitely social birds that are very smart, but the Corvids, they are special. They have they're their tool special. making and strategy and tool storage and communication mm -hmm. between each other and memories and things that are special. I don't, I don't yeah. see parrots, you know, parrots might be able to identify objects and, and learn phrases and do other really cool stuff, but it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's still pretty, pretty impressive though. Oh, it's but... definitely still impressive. It just feels like on a different level of yeah. organization. One thing I thought was very interesting. Um, so my when I was studying bird brains, the area of the brain that I focused on was the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is this area that's like, usually it's right on the top. So you've got in the pigeon, 
in the rear of the brain, it lengthens out and it becomes this very broad structure that's right on the top. It starts out kind of in the middle section. In the chicken, it's very similar. But the measurements that they did, they found that the chicken has massive numbers of neurons in the hippocampus compared to other birds, which I find very interesting. And I I want to understand why that is, but I'm not a graduate student anymore or a researcher. So somebody else has to do that for me. Um, yeah, but the carrion crow, man, beautiful, beautiful, big hippocampus, very large, clear brain structures. I'm very, I'm in love with, I'm in love with the crow brain. Um, they also did their neuron counts to try and determine which neurons were there. And yeah, anyway, long story short, yes. Crows, they, corvids, they have uh, more neurons in the right places to allow more complex cognitive thought. You know, right. if you think that more is better, then that's the correlation that, that you can therefore draw. More is better for some things, which apparently includes neurons. Yes. <laughs> apparently. Apparently neurons in this particular. Sometimes case. specific types in specific animals. Asterisk, 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 um, oh, and before we put you to sleep, because I really don't want to do that. I don't like putting, I mean, I really wanted you to put, to put you to sleep. I would just get the anesthesia out, knock you out, put you down, which we talked about on the show is very interesting. Anesthesia. It has this like wave, like, it just soothes the brain. And instead of the the brain having like this massive activity where the people are just that people, neurons are like active all over the brain at different times and having all their conversations with other neurons and blah, 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 blah. The brain's very going on its, its, its own thing. When uh, anesthesia gets in there, the brain, the neurons all go woo all together. Ooh, and it's a wave around the brain. Ooh, and it's like they, they all wanted the neurons all want to do the same thing and they, ooh, all together. That sounds very calming. <laughs> well, you're an anesthesia. So, yes, in a sense, it is. Um, researchers just uh, published this, this week, they were trying to figure out, look at anesthesia and the effects on brain functions and on brain activity, deep anesthesia. There's a phenomenon, it's called burst suppression. And so you have this synchronized activity and then a period of silence. This is burst and suppression. And the deeper the anesthesia, the shorter the phases of, you know, of the bursts. So you have mm. burst and lots of quiet. You know, So the deeper you're under, the less active your brain is. And so the more silence or suppression there actually is. And, you know, different anesthetics have different burst suppression patterns and they vary in their mechanism of action. And so these researchers were like, what is going on in here? And so they did an fMRI study and they decided to compare humans, monkeys, and rodents in a standardized method that, so that it was the same all across the board to see how anesthetized brains, all the different species' brains, uh, reacted under the fMRI and, and whether it showed the same pattern. And what they found is that all of the species had the same kind of burst suppression activation. However, the visual cortex in all of the species wasn't following the same pattern, except for the rats. So the visual cortex of monkeys, of primate, of pri the primates, of humans, um, the visual cortex was like, I'm not going to play along hmm. with your birth suppression game. Oh, I'm going to do what I want and have my own activity the whole time. So the visual cortex is like <clears throat> anesthesia, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> except in rats. And they found that in rats, the visual cortex did exactly what the anesthesia wanted. It did the burst suppression. It did, it did, the, it did the pattern the same exact way. And so the question now that these researchers are raising is, what's the difference in the rat brain? Why is the visual cortex 
following the birth suppression pattern when in the macaques, the marmosets, the humans, the visual cortex obviously was like one of these kids is doing its own thing. Why was it different? And if it is this different, should rats be used in a in a in brain models that um, are used for um, anesthesia, that are used for neural treatments, mm-hmm. that are used for so many different, you know, it eventually the research always ends up in humans before it, you know, in clinical trials before it gets used. But we find this big of a difference in the the pattern of activation. And it really makes you wonder about the models that we use for our research. Hmm. What could this mean? How could this manifest physically and practically if the if the visual cortex isn't playing along with anesthesia? What how could that what could that right, result well, just, in? It I don't know. I don't know, right. <laughs> I guess and that's, that, and that's another big question, yeah. right? What is happening? Why is there continued activation within the visual cortex when it is part of the brain? It's not like it's completely separate, but the one thing that they that they ask is like maybe it's because uh primates are primarily visual mm-hmm. that uh there has that there's something to do with even just uh, the way the visual cortex is activated during deep sleep or the way it's connected to other areas of the brain because it is such a primary sense Mm -hmm. for our survival that maybe there is some kind of uh, some aspect of its uh, its underlying importance. Right. Yeah. Primates have binocular vision, which is the forward facing eyes usually associated with with predators Right, and rats, so rats don't. of course have the 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 vision on the sides. I forget what the fancy word for that is, but it's um it's what prey has. <laughs> yeah. So it's so they're they're inputting that that information completely different because it's not a continuous field of view like binocular vision is. So it's they're processing the information completely different, but also if you want to think about it evolutionarily from like what that information is giving them, it's also different. If they're constantly looking for predators, but monkeys and primates are are foraging, using them for social interactions, hunting, it's kind of all related. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, they found this. They didn't expect to find this. And they don't understand why there's a difference. Mm-hmm. What yeah, does see it what mean? cats do. Are cat do cats do, you know, just pick right. another predator that's like similarly mm-hmm. quote unquote uncomplex, like a mouse, right? And see what's going on. Stop calling my cats uncomplex, you dogophile. You know what I, I mean. Dogs are quote unquote <laughs> uncomplex, also. You know, all yeah. those quadrupeds. I got you. Kind of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just stick figure mammals lump them all together right carnivora the carnivora yes oh i don't know we're just get wasting our time until the fungi come and eat us all so yeah, yeah. that's fine if i get to see a sentient is. slime mold I will succumb to it. It'll be a great day. <laughs> oh, you're amazing. You, know you, you can, can have eat it. me. That's you can fine. Just take it. It's Forgive fine. It. You deserve it. You've earned it. <laughs> well, that's it for me. I got brains. Mm-hmm. Animal brains, corvid brains. Mm-hmm. You had the the P and the C. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that, Blair. That of was... course. <laughs> You know, I like to keep it light. I know. I like it. I, I like We like it light. We like it fun. We like it enjoyable. That's all we want. Have we made it to the end of the show? Did we do it? We did it. Oh, my gosh. Definitely under uh, 90. This well, once week. we're done with all this stuff, it'll be, you know. Yeah, tight 90. That's yeah. what we're heading for. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to the show this week. If you have any questions, send them to us. We might be able to answer them on the air. You know, we like answering your questions. We could be doing that right now. If you had a question for us, we could be doing a quick answer segment if you had a question. But anyway, in the meantime, 
it's time for me to say thanks. Give shout outs to the people who help with the show. Fada, thank you so much for your help on show notes, show descriptions, on uh, social media, so many things. I appreciate you so much. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Gord, Arnlor, others who help to keep the chat rooms happy and safe and kind places to be. Thank you for being there. Rachel, thank you for editing the show and for your assistance. And I want to say thank you very much to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schofer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Bralfi Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Ragan, Dunn Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Nina Lamb, J John McKee, Greg Riley, Marques and Flo, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tian, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Chris Christopher Dreyer, Atiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. <laughs> Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if, if you want to support us on Patreon, hear your name at the end of the show head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We'll be back on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from youtube.com slash This Week in Science. Want to listen to us as a podcast? You can do that. Just look for us, This Week in Science, wherever podcasts are found. And if you enjoyed the show, hey, get your friends to listen too. For more information on anything you'd like to learn about that you heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. And I don't know, maybe someday we'll send out a newsletter again. Who knows? It'll be a huge <laughs> surprise when I, what's this in my inbox? What? Surprise from Twist. Come, you can... come around sometime. <laughs> you can bug us about that newsletter directly by emailing Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair Baz at twist.org. We like to keep it complicated by not letting anyone have the same emails. Anyway, just put twists in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into oblivion. Wait, I didn't make up a funny thing. What would you say, Blair? Um, I would say uh, be sure to put twists in the subject line or your email will be collected by a crow because it'll look nice and shiny. They'll take it to their, their tree spot. They'll polish it and change it and morph it into a tool. They'll they'll store it very carefully, but we will never, ever see it because they're going to protect it from they're the scary gonna... humans. And, yeah. and I'm not good at watching where the crows store their stuff. So, no, no, yeah. no, no. Just put twists in the subject line. You can also ping us on Twitter <laughs> where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. Oh, yeah. And we will be back here again here next week. And we hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is
Nazi is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. But we're not trying to threaten. Oh my goodness. Don't forget your towel. Oh, Blair, you've got it going on over there with your towel action. <laughs> you got to use it to its full potential, you know. You really do. Got to you know. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The toga. <laughs> toga. Yes. I'm ready to go to the it's hard. It's hard Roman to it the headphones. Yes. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I'm liking your headwear. Yeah. It's very yeah. nice. Well, you know, normally when I get out of the shower, it's, you know, I wrap it up. <laughs> this is a twist towel and it is available through Zazzle. And I got mine last summer and I really, really like it. It's great. And yes, Blair's crazy. She's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Give Blair a prop. She will use it. Yeah. How many ways can you use a towel? Blairica Bazdu. Oh, my goodness, Gora. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's very nice of them. Also, you no, know, you gotta remember the, the there's always the superhero cape too. You know. Oh, always. That's what I was working on earlier. To the moon and beyond, yeah. to infinity and beyond. Yes, I mean I could wear it as a skirt, but you can't see if I'm wearing it as a skirt. Very nice. Oh, yeah. So many uses for towels, everyone. Don't forget your towel day. Thank you for joining us for the show tonight. It was all good times. Yes. And Blair, you'll be here next week. I'll be here yes. next week. And yes. just be here next week. Yay, he'll be back. And he'll be Yay. on West Coast time this time. He'll be so confused. He's going to be, yeah. He'll be really tired, I'm going to guess. I'm well, it'll predict. be a week later, so yeah, but it'll be nighttime. He's used to doing this in the morning. I'm. I don't know whether that's going to be good or bad. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but he's going to be also visiting for the first time in ages, and so he's going to be like, "I gotta go do things." Yeah. yeah. The social like, calendar. I have my towel scarf. Oh, good. I tried to do that. Mine was too thick. My bees were too. It's a nice towel scarf. Good night, Fada. Thank you. It will keep me warm in the winter. A loose one twenty. Yes, Derek. <laughs> Golda Cedar says no capes. I can't. You know, capes get caught on things. They're not good. You know what? Things. It's it's a it's a decision. It's a risk. It's a risk. If you're a superhero and you have superpowers, do you really think a cape is going to hold you back? Is it really going to be like the limiting thing? Yeah. I mean, maybe if we're talking about like, oh, what was the one with uh, the with the shoveler and or the and the the what was the sh what was the one the shovel. <laughs> no capes <laughs> Garb, I have two tie-dyed towels that I've made also a couple of hand towels and some wash rags mystery men also, oh, mystery you. men yes 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 with the bowling ball that's right um, they had trouble with capes but I mean yeah. if you're I know the Incredibles yeah she was 
Yes. The rule yeah. is no capes. No I capes. Know. Designer. Yes. I'm not into fashion, okay? <laughs> as long as you have your towel, you're good. I try. I got my towel. I don't have fashion sense, but I have a towel. It's important. It is. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, uh -oh, you yawning? I've done it. I've yawned. <laughs> You've big gum. <sighs> Wait, no. No tie-dye socks. No. Okay, I this is tie-dye what... socks. I don't do tie-dye anything. I don't I, I don't like tie-dye. I love if it. If anybody can bring me find me something that is actually nice looking and tie-dye. I mean, I guess basic that would mean it doesn't look like it's been tie-dyed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should just open my closet and you can see how much tie-dye I have. I have a lot. <laughs> a lot. There, I don't know. I mean, maybe this, I, I mean, maybe I should investigate this, like dig into it in therapy or something. Like I have a thing. I don't like uh, reggae music and I don't like tie-dye. And I, I'm just now putting those together. I mean, huh. uh, are you familiar with indigo tie dye? Because I feel like that's the classy tie dye. It's blue. It's, 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 it's monotone. So it's like. You don't use rubber bands? I mean, you do. <laughs> Here, okay. I'm going to. I'm unplugging my <laughs> headphones. Hopefully, this doesn't totally mess up sound. <laughs> but hold on. Uh... <laughs> I know there. I know there are patterns. I know there are many patterns. Yes, no capes is a reference to the Incredibles. Absolutely, David, huh? Okay, check this out that I made. That's nice. <laughs> you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> like very ugly. <laughs> Please get it out of my face. Don't listen to me. I told you I'm not into fashion. <laughs> <laughs> it is for tie dye. It's very classy. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, my robe is tie dye. My towels are tie dye. My socks are tie dye. Wait, wait. Towels only get to be tie dye if you put like a sock in the laundry with them. You want to see my tie dye towel? You have tie dye. You have tie dye towels. <laughs> Just coffee count? Yes. I know, Gorov. Yeah, it's very nice. And I'm sure it looks lovely on Blair. I'm sure so it does. It's one just of them's not, currently it's not for used, me. Not but for me. This what? one like, changed over time. It was there was more dye on it before. But the other thing that's really cool that I have is I Yeah, is her shirt T-Rex? I think it might be. Is my shirt what? T-Rex. Yes. yes. Bed sheets, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, though, are they night? Like, what's the material? They're uh, high thread count cotton. Mm. Did you do those? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There you You're go. a fancy tie dyer. Wait, I remember, weren't you using a tie-dye, one of your tie-dye sheets as a backdrop for a while? No, that was fabric that I bought at um, like a Joann's or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, but what you do, see, this is the hack. See, Gaurav and, Gaurav and Derek, they love that. Oh, yeah. Yes. So um, uh, you go to like a Ross or a TJ Maxx or something like that and um plain white bed sheets and towels and all this kind of stuff are usually really cheap yeah you can buy those and then you tie dye them it's great and of course you one pot of indigo like i've never used it all i've always put it away like i'm gonna use it later and then i have to throw it away like a month later um but does you it can go bad it does yeah it does go bad um interesting it's it's different from the like hyper color tie dye that you usually see it's um it has natural 
what's the deal with it? It's like, what's the deal with indigo tie dye? I have no idea. Um, I don't know much about the indigo tie dye. It's, <laughs> we just it's need more. To- it's it's definitely more hippy dippy. It's like, it's more all naturally. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yes, so Noodle know, says indigo, it's Claire's tie dye corner. Indi, uh, in uh, let's see. I hear my cat. Indigo powder, but it's insoluble in water. So for dyeing, you have to turn, you have to reduce it to a water soluble form. It's like chemistry. It's very cool. So you have your indigo, you have a reducing agent, and then you have a right. base. So you have your soda ash, you have your reducer, which is, I forget what it usually is. And then um, you throw that into water and you stir it and it has to sit. And then it like, quote unquote, makes a beautiful, but stinky flower in the center. So it looks like. <laughs> It looks like a like a mucky green, like bloom in the center of the pot, in the center of the the bucket. And if you look at the the film, there's like a film on the top of it. it looks really gross. It's like oily looking, like almost like iridescent green. But if you break it, then the water looks kind of just dark. And then when you soak the stuff, like when when this sheet came out, yeah, you put it then you put it in the sun for it to fix. It turned bright green. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When did it turn blue? When you rinse it. Oh. How fascinating. Cool. Yeah. It's very cool. See, Garav, the beauty about this and me, quote unquote, talking colors is that it's just one color. Yeah. Can you tell the difference between the, when it's green and when it's blue? Yeah. Yeah. The green is like a fluorescent green. Yeah. Hi, kitty cat. She hates being picked up. She just, she purrs and puts up with it for two seconds. I'm trying to find a picture of it when it's in the sun and it's turning green. <laughs> Hi, kitty. Hi, kitty. Bye, kitty. She's like, I'm out of here. Wow, I would feel I came, like I shed. What are you looking at? Um, I'm trying to find a picture of when it's green. The in between step. I love the I love the uh, the chemistry of it. That's it's really interesting. Yeah, here's a cool. That it has to work in a very particular way to make yeah, it to right. yeah. My medic is trying to sleep. Um, okay. <laughs> Share, please. Share screen window. This one. Okay. So, so yeah, it, it like turns very green in the sun. So this is what it looks like in the sun. And then when you, um, I see all the blue. Yeah. And then when you're about to wash it out, it will, it will turn blue in the sun over time. And then when you go to rinse it, the interior still looks kind of green. Hmm. It's very cool. Oh yeah, so like this is kind of what uh, my yeah. stuff look like. Yeah. That is very green. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. And so yeah, so here's like the pot. There's the like I want to see some of that green oh, stuff. Oh, oh yeah, and then the water looks like weird and murky and green. Murky. Murky. Oh, here's the the quote unquote. Beautiful but stinky flower. <laughs> there it is. What do you do? Do you just dump it on your lawn when you're done? Uh, I forget what I did. I probably dumped it in a toilet or something. <laughs> uh, poor toilet. Yeah. It's a beautiful stinky flower. <laughs> I wouldn't describe it that way, but maybe it is just very stinky. To some people, I'm sure it's beautiful. <laughs> the fascinating stinky <laughs> lump. <laughs> exactly, Derek. It looks like something intelligent wants to crawl out of that bucket. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I would it looks welcome like it. like the slime mold. <laughs> My house is, is, a, is a shrine to it at this point. I welcome so. our slime lord masters. <laughs> truth i love it i love yeah 
tie dyeing with indigo. It's very fun. That's a fun, it's a fun crafty thing too. Yeah. I made a handkerchief for Brian and I made him a robe. I made us matching robes when we like. Very cute. Pretty much had just started dating. I made us matching tie dye robes. <laughs> it was a bold choice. It was a very bold me. choice. Good choice though. Yeah. That was the, the part of my dating where I was like, I'm going to go hard. I'm going to lean real hard into being unapologetically me to scare away the people that can't handle it. Can you handle the Blair? Yeah. Mm. I'm not can't handle the down. Blair, we don't want you around here. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, a tie-dye twist calendar. That's a great idea. Yeah. That'd be pretty fun. Yeah, I bet Derek, you does he fun. wear it at the hospital? No, he uh, wears it on camping trips. <laughs> 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 the handkerchief, I'm guessing, not the robe. He wears the robe oh. every day. Oh, noodles. Are you going to pick up one of these towels? These towels are very nice and they're available on, Zaz on Zazzle. Zazzle. Zazzle twists. Ca uh, not a calendar. Towel. It's not tie-dye. Sorry. I am unapologetically not wearing tie-dye. <laughs> well, you just apologized, so... <laughs> That was just a vocal of a, a verbal tick. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it happens. Animals, animals in tie dye. I wonder how. I wonder how that would. I wonder how. What imagining you would have of tie dye calendar? Oh. Oh. I don't know if I have the skills to do animals in the tie dye. I could do like the background as tie dye. I could definitely yeah. do that. It would be interesting at our Zazzle right now. I'm curious if um, the towel has sold well. No idea. I oh, like it. Please. I like when it shows us how many. Uh, orders all time. One. You're holding it. <laughs> and this is it. I've got the only one in existence. There you go. Hopefully not for long. Sort of ah, up. Paul, you're apologetic. Waka, 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 waka. Our highest selling item, do you want to know? What is it? The Twist Basic Logo T. Oh, cool. Our second most popular item? Good. Yeah. The Mammoth Face Mask. Ah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, the masks are all very high. <laughs> Um, then the third most popular is the twist logo mug. Then comes the, um, the cotton face mask that's black with the twist logo on it. It's kind mm -hmm. of small. Then the red panda, uh, mask. Mask. Then the twist logo face mask. Then the twist trucker hat. Oh, cool. Trucker then the hat. twist okay. mouse pad. Then you guessed it, another mask. <laughs> this is a tortoise mask. <laughs> um, you know, I'm glad everybody was styled up. Yeah. Then we have the nice. twist hoodie and very cool, the twist polo shirt. The twist hoodie is awesome. Oh, yeah, the, the polo shirt. Okay. I'm yeah. glad a few people have gotten those. Um, yeah, and then we have we have some other cool stuff. The I have to say, I am very proud here, I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share. Proud of this one, which is sold sold pretty well. Yeah, yeah Aaron Laura. Weird. Did something happen that everybody wanted masks? <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I like this one a lot. Oh yeah, that one's a great the dung beetle tote the bag. The dung beetle grocery tote tote. It even has um the twist logo on the back. Yeah, I like that one. I like it a lot. Um, I was hoping to see. Oh, yeah, there it is. To carry all your, well, you know. Because <laughs> get it? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a poop beetle. <laughs> well. So I was evoking a yeah. word that started with S for that. Thank you. <laughs> 
Look at all the other cool things you could put it on. You can put it on a con compact mirror. Yeah, you can you can take these things and put them on things yourself. It's true. Gorob likes the dung beetle tote bag. Yes. We like it also. A button bottle opener. That's fun. Ooh, a charge hub. Oh, a little watch. Cute. Anyway. Did you see did you see my uh my my cute clothing con collection? Yeah. I made a collection. Oh no, it's not there. Nope. Nope. No collection. Oh, I have to you. log out, I think. Oh, right. And just go to the the thingy. The placey, the thingy. I made a whole a whole little collection of our cute clothes. Oh, collections. It's, collections. Use your, use your eyes and your brain, Blur. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cute. Cute. How come I can only see the back of this one? Is that all it is? The back? No, I don't think so. I don't know. Oh, yeah. There it is. Full yeah. of sciencey goodness. There it is. There it is. Oh, yeah. I spent a really long it? time fighting with this one, actually, to make it look that good. That tank looks great. Because you have to, like, pick a color for this. <laughs> and orient oh, yeah. it right. It does look kind of like poops. <laughs> <laughs> but then you get a poop, it's a poop oh, tank. That? It's, a <laughs> it's not a poop tank. Uh... Yeah, nice little tote. There he is. Tote. It's totes amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And it's towel day. Oh, and here's all our masks. There you go. I know. It might be good to show the Zazzle store more often. You're right, Derek. And at some and at one point I used to open it up and go to it and <sighs> I think I'm a tired person. <laughs> Lots of clicking and opening, but you're absolutely correct. It would probably oh, be very more. helpful. Very helpful. Um, you know what you can add with your towel? What's that? Let's see if I can find it without too much trouble. No, it's going to be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the troubles. Sort by... Newest, please. Oh, yes. Here we go. Just, you know, a shower curtain. A shower curtain. <laughs> you, too, can have a twist shower curtain. With alligators on it. How appropriate. Yeah. Alligators that Blair made. thought it was a fun pattern. I think it's great. It's a great pattern. Doormat, a different Testudianese doormat. There's two to pick from. I know. The pillow. I kind of want to order these for um, my friends with kids for their Ooh, babies. Right? I need to get. I need to get the throw pillows. Yeah, they're fun. I always give them away. I don't have any myself yet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I really want this one actually. This is the one I think I really want. Because my current um, Duchess and Dragon oh. character is a Panamanian golden frog. <laughs> really? Yes. How does that work? Are you... What a character... What is your character? She's a grung. It's a new expansion. Um, okay. It's a frog I... person. And she's a grung bard. Bard. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Kai so, just got into Dungeons and Dragons and he is darn it I've forgotten the name of it, it it's a kike it's a kiker or something but it's a bird a bird mage an, an aracocra it's a cocra no not an aracocra 
but it's like a crow. It's like a crow man. <laughs> a crow. So the the kenku is what you're talking kenku. about. Kenku. Yes, the he's kenku. a kenku. The thing yes. about the kenkus, though, the reason I've never played as a kenku is that they're not really supposed to be able to say anything other than repeating things. Yes, so he can repeat anything that he's heard. Right. So but I told him what he needs to do is get a notepad. I don't think he's doing this because he's 11 and not that planning ahead yet. But what if what he really needs to do is get a notepad so that he can write down the things that people have said that he can say so that he can say them. But yeah, yeah. they're mimics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so testicles leaving and he's saying that, oh, he's not going to get answers to any of his questions, but I'm, I'm scrolling back. I don't see any questions. Please write them again. Cause I don't what see questions. Them. I don't see any. Hmm. Are we selling stuff? Well, we, yes. Twist sells things. We have things that we sell. We have merchandise. We're just going through it right now. Um, what else did you ask? Mm, is tie dyeing the topic for this week? No, it was just a topic for the after show. <laughs> All the things. But maybe next week we will answer your questions directly. I don't, I don't know what they. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the reality is, I don't necessarily have the answers. <laughs> Fair. I mean, <laughs> I try. I definitely try, but <sighs> we don't. We we don't always have the answers. No, 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 no indeed. Oh, and um, so I was. I saw, and I put it on Twitter a while ago. It was a couple of weeks ago, actually. Now at this point, movies. Mm -hmm. I saw Moonfall. Which mm. I expected to be like just dumb and awful. And I really enjoyed it. Nice. <laughs> it was very internally consistent and it was silly, you know, like, but it was, it was a, it was fun and I really enjoyed it. So if, um, yeah, I was not expecting to, but uh, my whole family got into it. And anyway, Moonfall surprisingly surprisingly entertaining not hmm. awful sci-fi i liked it that's always nice yeah yeah and it's you know not all sci-fi has to be serious right you can have fun with it so i liked it Ooh, arn lore played a, wait who played a kenku arn lore a kenku yeah. monk kenku monk it was very fun yeah. Haha, <laughs> it can be foul for sure. Waka waka waka. That's funny. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, it's pretty awesome though. There's a uh one of Kai's friends' mom's mom. Mm -hmm. She has liked B and D for a long time. So she taught herself. She learned how to be a dungeon master. And so had, during COVID had been doing virtual um, D and D games with like a, a group of her lady friends. And then she's like, I'm going to start doing it for the kids. And so now she has a whole group of these 11 year old boys who she's leading on a journey <laughs> and they're having so much fun. That's great. Yeah. Iron Lord, you're a mod for D D Beyond. That's wow. Oh, that's so cool. That's very cool. That's I definitely have that app in my phone right now. Uh, yeah. I'll let Kai know. Yeah, being a DM is hard. You have to have you have to be ready. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, okay, being a DM is hard. Being a DM for a bunch a bunch of um short attention span 11 year olds. Yeah. Even harder. She's amazing. <laughs> she gets my mom of the year vote. Wow. <laughs> She's That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. That's great. Brian's trying to build a, a game right now. He's excited to DM at some point. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. 
I think it would be pretty fun to do a one shot, the three of us. It could be fun. Yeah. Perhaps a fundraiser of some sort. Ooh. D and D fundraiser. I'd have to make up a character beforehand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We could figure it out. Maybe I would have to be a Kenku. Maybe. I am a bit of a bird brain. Are there any cat characters? I want to yeah, a there's cat. a lot. <laughs> there's lions. This is, I got really upset. Is going to be a tiger? I, uh, yeah, you could definitely, I mean, you could be, so there's, um, uh, what are they called? Tabaxi? Tabaxi. Right? Tabaxi? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they're basically cats and you can like make them look like whatever. But there's also like lion mm. things. There's a bunch of different types of cats, but like, I got frustrated because in the last one, I ended up being a frog. Or originally, I wanted to, um, I wanted to be a um, golden retriever uh, bard that was just like overly friendly with everybody, <laughs> like obnoxiously friendly. There's no dog races. There's no dog races in D and D, and I'm like, you have like six different kinds of cats. How do you have no dogs? That's really funny. Yeah. yeah. Unusual. Dr. Kenku. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it kind of makes sense. Blair is a druid and Justin as a bard. <laughs> Spoony bard. <laughs> uh, I don't want to do a 36 hour continuous live stream fundraiser. That's a long one. Pamela's amazing for doing that. And yes, Goldazator Cat yeah, is greater it? than yeah. Pamela. Oh, the hippos. Yes. So last I, I looked, they're not playable. Oh. The hippos. No hippos for you. Yeah. They're like they're like NPCs, basically. So they're... Right. They can be in a story, but it was not a legal playable character last time I checked, unfortunately. Maybe someday. You know I'm going to jump on that hippo wagon as soon as it's possible. <laughs> Oh, it will be playable in July. Ooh, well, thank you, Aaron Lord. It's coming up. You can not be a frog and you could be a hippo. Yes, I do really like my frog, though. That's cool. Spelljammer. Bum, bum, bum. Who is the bard in Witcher in the series? I mean, the TV series, but he's like a golden retriever dog. He's like, huh. <laughs> he's like super friendly to everybody. Oh, he's got a song. Cute. Mm. yeah i thought it would be really fun to be to be that and then also like get really easily distracted by things <laughs> <laughs> like just randomly chase stuff oh gotta go yeah <laughs> uh. um also my my frog is yeah i think i picked true neutral for her which has been really fun to play actually <laughs> So she's like not that concerned about laws or what's right or wrong. She just does what's interesting. I like that. She's very inquisitive. She's like she's very interested in figuring out what people are about and observing information. Huh. How similar to you is your character? Not very. Um, my very first character I did in D and D was a um, gnome druid, and I feel like I was just playing myself. But um, <laughs> then, since then, I've I done some crazy things. Like the one that I did for I think a couple years was a um, dragonborn cleric um, who worshipped the trickster god and was basically like oh. a purveyor of games and gambling, and um, a swindler and like a snake oil salesman of sorts. But just also like really friend friendly. Oh, that's fun. So like everyone, you know, the first time we fought some people, like everybody was like, all right, what's our way in? And I just kind of walk over and I go, hello. <laughs> <It's> like, <"The." laughs> um, so it's not like me really. I mean, I'm friendly, but otherwise. Not that friendly. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then the frog, I'm not the frog for sure. Um but I'm playing a Monster of the Week game now. And in that, um, 
I get to play a moody teen, which is very fun. I've been using my vocal fry. Of course you have. <laughs> to read Shakespeare. Yes, yes. Except in this case, I'm a um, half Gorgon looking for her lost uncle. Half Gorgon? Yeah. So do you... Do you not quite turn people to stone? Do not turn people to stone. I didn't get any of the powers. Oh, okay. But I do have snakes for hair. Awesome. Are they dead or alive? Oh, they're alive. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I need to get my friend David Schiff Schiffman to come on the show. Completely changing the topic. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through things. And Fada had been posting about Sharkano, this eruption of Sharkano, which I really, really don't like that name. <coughs> Excuse me. Cat hair. <clears throat> but um, he has a book on sharks that's out. We should get him on the show to talk about sharks. Yes, please. Sharkano. I love sharks. I know. I know. Sharks are great. Sharky, 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 sharky. Sharky, sharky. Oh, and you mentioned earlier, you were like, you... You were like, more money for birds. And um, so the researcher I used to work for, apparently, there's a story in New Scientist this week, apparently um, her lab in Cambridge, at Cambridge University, because of Brexit and some other funding issues, has run out of funding. <coughs> and so they have to rehouse their corvids. Mm. They have a bunch. Of, it's a, it is one of the corvid research labs in the in the world one of the I only will ones take them i know i will take your corbins but yeah they're looking for seventy five thousand dollars a year to be able to maintain the lab and keep the birds otherwise they have to get rid of them adopt them out train them to go back to the wild that kind of thing mm -hmm. it's kind of sad yeah Excuse me, I have got something tickling my throat. Yes, Kai enjoyed the Dragon Prince a lot, Arnlor. Mm. That was a that was a favorite in the house. The Tau Herculid meteor shower. I hadn't thought about it. Unfortunately, being up in Portland. <laughs> It's always cloudy, and so I've just kind of given up on meteor showers. Uh, ooh, Tales of Exadia. <clears throat> May 31st. That's right soon. How fun. The biggest ever. Oh, my goodness. Garav, that wasn't even on my radar. Thank you for bringing that up. Maybe I will be. I know. Go east. You know, I just have to go to the eastern part of Oregon where it's just dry and there are skies that you can look up at and uh, and see things. That would be nice. It's a crapshoot here. Sometimes we have extremely clear nights and sometimes it's socked in. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like most of the time it's clear, but every once in a while we'll just get a fog bank. Yeah. We are still right next to the bay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite as clear. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the bay is foggy, but mm -hmm. yeah. But Redwood City, climate's best by government test. Yes. Yes. Very good. Ah, see the Milky Way, where we now know there's a black hole because we've now seen it, which is so exciting. This time of the year is the midnight sun. Eric, is it like daytime <laughs> right now? <laughs> I'm sure. I've just noticed, I've been noticing here even in Portland, 
that it's lighter later and the huh. sun is up very early in the morning and it's it's very light and within the next month we're going to be seeing it'll be it'll be light until about 9 30 up here yeah. yeah yeah and so it's completely bright in alaska right now Whoosh. it's amazing wow i can't imagine what that's Midday. like <laughs> right you have to have uh, blackout curtains. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you turned 30 this summer solstice. Welcome to 30s. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Blair wants the telomere pill. Yeah. There's so many others. It's too late for me. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Oh my goodness. I am like so excited or so not so excited. So thankful for modern medicine. My dad just went in for open heart surgery this week. And last year, about a year ago, he went in and the surgery went all wrong and we were afraid that we were going to lose him, but he survived. And then they let him heal and they kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I was like, and they, my dad was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get this surgery. I might, might, might die before I get the surgery. And they finally scheduled it on his wife's birthday. And he's doing really great. It, I got a picture of him today, which I'm very excited. His like his skin has color. Like there's blood flowing in his body again. It's amazing. He's like, yeah, two days out of open heart surgery and he already looks better than before he went in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I'm so thankful for for all of the, you know, yeah, the medicine, the surgery, the techniques that we have. His wife sent me a picture of his, of the mid-surgery of his heart. <laughs> so I've got pictures of my dad's chest open with the heart, Whoa. his heart. It's like, oh my God, that's my dad's heart. <laughs> it's wild. Wow. Yeah, I'm not sharing those pictures. It's a bit, you know. Not, so did they have like an operation theater that she was in or? No, no, no. The the surgeons took it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Don't drop a junior mint in there. <laughs> Don't drop a junior mint in there. Oh, no. Yeah. Thank you, Noodles. Oh, Noodles. Uh, Wait, Blair. Noodles says hello. Hello, Noodles. What is this in? I don't see Noodles over here. Is this in Discord? Discord. Oh, Discord. yeah. Discord. Discord. One too many windows to open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Derek has a birthday on the 22nd. Birthdays are coming up all around, Solstices. Uh, 4.30 a.m. sun in Winnipeg. Yeah, it's a bit early, isn't it? Cool Zader, I don't know how flat earthers explain midnight sun. They're nothing they it it, they it find never a way, makes, I'm sure. <laughs> it never makes sense. They always find a way to explain it's it. It's like, well, you know, that somebody is turning down turning up the light, turning down the light. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Our and Laura's right. Probably like 30 different ways, each of which contradict the rest. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Ha. Oh, Eric, that's really funny. Really related to midnight sun. You get used to it. Or in my case, I was born here, so I get confused when it gets dark in the summer when I travel. <laughs> why, why is the light going out? Unless you travel to Iceland or Norway or Sweden, you know, other places where it stays up late. In the Arctic Circle. Thanks, Derek. Oh, Derek's birthday will be a twist Wednesday. Nice. Fantastic. <laughs> How good were the surgeon's photography skills? I mean, they're fine. For... <laughs> Derek, did you take the picture of your colon? That's confusing. Put it on your Christmas cards. <laughs> good. <laughs> Ah, that's great. 
Oh, I can't get that link. I don't know what that link is, RMR. Noodles, what did Noodles say about DM? The Bard and Druid classes have really become more frontline power classes than support only. Kind of like spite clerics. <laughs> I want to be a spite cleric. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Knapp, right? Valentine's Day cards. That would be good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Draw it so like the the wall is kind of in the shape of a heart. <laughs> a lifelike dog costume. I don't think science can explain something like no. that. Arnold. And I don't want to see it. <clears throat> you know, there is a lot of stuff in the world. It is outside the realm of science <laughs> you know we don't have to explain everything with science I don't, I don't think there's some things we should just let let lie <laughs> anthony oh my gosh this comes from deep within me <laughs> happy valentine's day uh. sunset to, yeah okay it's 10 16 here right now sunset 11:06 p.m. wow in anchorage amazing jeez that's amazing oh Aaron Lore wanted to know if we saw the onion yes the onion posted the same article that they always post what oh on a shooting it's the same oh. one every time Okay, yeah, no, I didn't see it, but yeah. Yeah. I don't want to misquote it. Uh, no way to prevent this, says only nation where this regularly happens. <laughs> yeah. They post it every single every time, time, and I appreciate their dedication to the bit. That, that is how they're going to do it. It's just, they don't even edit it at all. I, I mean, why? <laughs> is there anything different? No. Nothing's changed. How did this happen? Yeah. Oh, they blanketed their homepage with every single version of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All of them. Yeah, someone else uh, on Facebook, or a few people, I saw one person on, on Facebook today um, share a list of all of the school of all shootings since 1998. Mm -hmm. It's just a massive list. And you just, it just scrolls. And you're just like, really? <laughs> how, how, how? Like, I almost did a, dis wrote the disclaimer tonight about that, but then yeah. I decided against it. But it's tough. I'm, I'm kind of glad you didn't. It's like everywhere. And yeah, I'm it's again, like, this site. is exactly yeah. here. I'm just going to, promote the onion for a second <laughs> so yeah they uh they just filled their page with it just every no time way to prevent it. this oh look i've been looking at plant stands you can tell what my analytics are doing um <laughs> yeah so they just posted the whole they plastered the whole home page with it because it's very frustrating mm-hmm it is very frustrating. And yeah, what's what's ridiculous to me is there's just so many things. <laughs> it's like a majority, um, not just a small majority, but like a majority of Americans want to change things and they're not changing. And it's just like, what is happening here? Yeah. What is going on? Yeah, well, I mean, we saw this just a couple of weeks ago that the majority of Americans wanted to keep Roe v. Wade and that, you know, is not happening. So it doesn't matter what the majority of Americans want in this democracy. <laughs> so when in the course of human events it becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it's just, you know, it's that whole representative democracy thing that, you know, is steeped in racism and sexism and uh, ableism and... It's, um, yeah, it is, but it's not just that. Wars. It's, it's, it's <laughs> also status quo. I mean, where you have... I don't know where you have the the Democratic Party just run by a bunch of people who want to keep everything the same. And they're like, oh, no, we've got to stay in the center, stay in the center. And so, like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sick and tired of just stuff. But, well, the, the yeah. problem is voting. They say yes. you have to stay in the center and then one side keeps shifting. And then the center moves, you see. <laughs> but they keep saying, let's stay in the center. And right. Yeah. So yeah. as things move more right, the center also moves more right. Mm -hmm. you see? It's dumb. Yeah. It's dumb. I hate it. And I won't yeah, but uh, yeah. The situation anymore. Hopefully more people will vote, 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 vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's midterms and um, yeah, and elections happening right now that if I was less angry, I would definitely ignore. <laughs> if I'm being honest, like I have received so many paper print ads and text messages and phone calls about an election for like council people and mm -hmm. all sorts of things that, uh, but I'm gonna sit down and look through my guide and find endorsements and make my own decision and fill out my ballot. Even though it's, this system is also stupid because there's a million elections and none of them are days off of work. Yep. <laughs> and the, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. From BB, you're right too. Very often you have a structure that requires a particular type of person to navigate it. And that promotes more of the same type of person as a candidate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Career yeah. politicians, right? Takes yeah. money and um, people who can do that instead of working. It means that they come for money or they have been given money. <laughs> by who? Or or you get, get money given to you by Bitcoin billionaires. Right. Yes. It's interesting, though, here in uh, Oregon, one of the, the, the big, what is it, Bitcoin billionaire, he put a whole bunch of money in various races and didn't make a darn bit of difference. <laughs> Oregonians are like, I'm just going to vote for whoever I want. <laughs> we're going to. We're not going to pick that that person. Yeah, it's tough. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, what for BB says about the structure that requires a person to navigate it to run. It also requires a particular type of person to navigate it to vote. Mm -hmm. Which is the other yeah. problem. Yeah, and when there are barriers put up and there are, you know, difficulties in even making it possible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Derek. Yay for votes not being bought for once. Exactly. Boy, Pennsylvania, R and Laura. You've got some good stuff going on there. Oof. Oh yeah, Dr. Oz. Mm-hmm. Who doesn't even live there, right? So <laughs> that's especially interesting. Yeah, we had a huge uh a huge thing. There is a a writer, a New York Times columnist. Um, I am blanking on his name, but he apparently grew up in Oregon, but then left and has been living in New York for decades and, but still has property here in Oregon, but was not a resident of Oregon and has not voted in any Oregon elections for years being a New York resident. And so he wanted to come in and run for governor of Oregon. It's like, oh, oh no, I, I, I moved back for COVID. So now, now I want to be the governor of Oregon. I see you've got problems. And, I, and everybody was throwing money to support him. And it was like, yeah, yeah, he's got great ideas. He's going to do really great. If you're not, if you haven't voted in, if you're not a resident in the place where you want to be in charge, it's not a problem. Like, don't you think you should know more about the place that you want to 
run. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all silly. You want to govern? It's, oh, politics. You need strong term limits so that people just can have a career, takes a couple years off to do a politic, and then go, do back, a to their, go back to their <laughs> career. And that's it. Because then Wait. you don't have to worry about re-election mm. and about um, kind of uh, their constituents. They can just be elected and do what they think is right for their people. <laughs> and then leave. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There definitely does need to be something built into the governmental system for institutional memory so that things can happen over time. The term limits need to have overlap so that projects can have long-term benefits. Well, so it's staff, not like a... Right? You have well, like a I, huge I, staff too. Right. But I mean, I'm thinking in, in, in terms of like... Well, I mean, for elections and stuff, people want to get elected in and they, they're not going to run on fixing the sewers. You know, they're going to run on, you know, the big shiny, the shiny stuff. I'm going to get you better Internet or, you know, we're going to we're going to make your city a more equal place. You know, these big shiny things and not the things that actually help keep a city running. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, you know, so yeah well but yeah. you know it's why why do they do the shiny things because they want to get reelected, right exactly so it's i don't it feels like it should be a sabbatical like you make whatever you made in your last job <laughs> you just take a couple years off you take a sabbatical to be a council person or a senator or you know a congressman or woman or person or yeah xyz even the president <laughs> just take, just take some time off and come back it's i don't know That's, yeah I agree and yes with that. our lord there needs to be term limits on the judges that's insane <laughs> it's it's absolutely ludicrous that you can make decisions for a country for decades <laughs> for your lifetime <laughs> ridiculous uh yeah i agree I, all politicians should make minimum wage totally yep yep and not get handouts all the time so they don't even have to spend the money they make <laughs> what was it there was that thing a long time a, a while back where some politician was trying to make a big thing of like i'm gonna live on minimum wage for a week and show you how it's done and they couldn't do it mm -hmm. <laughs> they like had all these exceptions well i'm gonna live on minimum wage except for this mm -hmm. and except except for that except for my apartment <laughs> except for like all these uh, and it's like you didn't even do it <laughs> that was just <laughs> your politicking is annoying propaganda <laughs> cut it out yeah no i i read i read um a piece of investigative re reporting from the 80s or 90s when in my it was actually it was pretty interesting it was in my chicano and latino studies class is what it was called at the time um and it was about a woman um who to write an article went and tried to live on minimum wage as a waitress in the south oh. and um there because you factor tips into minimum wage. She only made two bucks an hour, like two fifteen yep. or something like that. Yep. And um, she, I think she made it a week, maybe ten days, and had to cancel because she ended up homeless and um, had no way to travel between her workplace and like. So it was a huge problem where when she had a place to live, it was like a trailer in a trailer park, and she. Um, had to take the bus like a couple hours and walk like an hour each way or something. Yep. And then she lost that spot because she couldn't make the rent. And then um, she ended up living out of her car. <laughs> and then there was such a situation where she couldn't pay for food for a couple of days. And she was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I have to give up now. <sighs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and that's what people do. I mean, the, and it still is the case that, minimum wage in some places is calculated that way that it's the tips that make it up to minimum wage yeah, but see tips are optional exactly 
so you don't necessarily get it. Yep. Yeah, to our and Laura's putting there, unless the total tips are less than the 725 minimum wage, which overrides it. Okay, so what hasn't always been that way, mm -mm. but it's still, still ridiculous. The fact that, yeah. That's, I mean, that's just barely, that's just, that's not enough. <laughs> it's nowhere near enough. <sighs> oh, America, hmm. the world, the future, all the things. There are so many things out there. I think there, you know, there are a lot of people working for good. There was just a big, on Friday, a big um, student walkout for protesting protesting uh for climate change mm -hmm. which you know the next generation they're already active and they're doing stuff and they're really pushing youth activism is huge to try and make changes in the way that we do business um yeah like garov said earlier it'll be interesting when the younger generations really start voting it'll be interesting to see what happens but A lot of these things are choices, and we can choose to try to help make things better. Pay it forward. I don't. I always love the pay it forward idea. What can we do? How can we help others? How can we pay it forward? Donate to help Ukraine. Donate. Donate to help those in need. I saw somebody um, who lives in Seattle said, hey, if you end up in a state where, you, where you're not able to get an abortion and you know me, just give me a call. Let me know. You can come here. <laughs> I'll give you housing. <laughs> I support you. So, you know, maybe we can support by supporting people when they need help if we can offer it in a variety of different ways. And we can vote. Vote, 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 vote. Also vote with your dollars. Don't be a mindless consumer, automaton. No. Vote with your dollars. I spend my dollars at places I like. Hello, Mr. Tiny Corn Dog. Mm-hmm. Human science. Identity for a year. Hilarious. <laughs> More t-shirts with science. Yes. Vote for people who, who appreciate, who understand science, who want science-based policy making. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Fnord Prefect, I just want to, I do want to address this um, statement. <laughs> okay. I'd vote if I had someone to vote for. I refuse yeah, to vote yeah. against someone just because they're slightly less awful than the other guy. That's great. However, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are rights that can be taken away as a result of that. So consider the fact that sometimes you have to make a decision between two things you don't want, but one is better than the other, because if you do nothing, the worse option will succeed and people will straight up lose things. And this is exactly what happened in 2016. We yes. are dealing with the fallout of people not voting because they didn't like other option right now. So I hear you. I understand it sucks, but I'm sorry. You have to go vote if you care about people who are in trouble right now. You have to go do it. You hold your nose and vote. I'm sorry. You have to. Otherwise, you're contributing to the problem that is destroying lives. And that's my soapbox moment for today. Woo soapbox. Mm 
Yep. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I just oh. could, I couldn't leave that. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, no, it's fine. You know, it is really a shame that this is, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in where this is, these are the choices that we have to make, right? The two-party system is stupid. <laughs> yes, but I indeed. physically can't fix that. No. What I physically can do yes. is vote in primaries for the people that I want. Yeah. And then vote for the better choice in the end. And that's it. That's all I can do. The question, according to Arnlor, would you rather have the squirrel party or the giant panda party elected? Oh, no. <laughs> I think the squirrel party, and I'll tell you why. They would oh. allocate resources better. <laughs> oh, Blair's going to give the squirrel stump stump speeches. Yeah. <laughs> you know, would I even vote though for hippo if I could, of course, I will squirrels vote hippo are nuts. in hippo v squirrel every time. <laughs> but if I have squirrel v panda, I will vote squirrel, and I will smile doing it because I know I'm doing the right thing for myself <laughs> and for the people I care about. I think this is a new T-shirt that needs to be made. Hippo is greater than squirrel is greater than panda. Yeah. <laughs> We could add more in there. We could. <laughs> Hippo is greater than spider. Sp it's greater than spider. Which is greater than... Oh, right. Because, yeah, you're not a fan of spider. We'll say much. dolphin. Which is greater than <laughs> squirrel. Which is greater than panda. Pandas are always bottom yeah. of the heap. Yeah. Sorry. Last choice. <laughs> and then oh, under oh. it you write all glory to the hypnotoad for sure <laughs> yeah. oh, i love it all right is it bedtime now it is bedtime I'm tired now. myself out from my stump speech <laughs> <laughs> fair enough it's time for bed it was energy well spent good resource allocation on your part thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right say good night blair good night blair say good night kiki good night kiki good night everyone good night, justin, have a... wherever you are <laughs> yeah good night justin he's actually arriving probably in the daytime and then he's gonna be like i'm sleepy but anyway he'll be back next week hopefully and Hopefully, we will see you all here again. Thank you so much for joining us for science and lots of different conversational talk in the after show. That was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Who are you? Tell us. Are you Team Squirrel or Team Panda? We want to know. We want to know. As the elections come up, who are you voting for? <laughs> Uh, stay safe, everybody. Be healthy. And as always, be curious. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>